فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في الثقافات وتنهل بروب الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Once again, my brothers, my sisters, we always praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek His protection from, we seek His protection against all evil and we ask Him every goodness, not just for us, but for humanity at large. And we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all those who were sent from the very beginning to remove us from darkness and to take us to the light. Ameen. And we ask Allah to bless their companions and to bless every one of us and to grant us all the best of this world and the next. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, every year the month of Ramadan comes. And this month it brings about a different joy. We become happy people, mashallah, during the month of Ramadan, especially when we're about to see the moon. And then once the moon is sighted and the excitement of the first few nights of Taraweeh sort of dwindles, we find the masjid is slightly empty and people start beginning to feel like, gosh, I've still got 27 days to go, right? And then when you're in this part of the world, subhanallah, it becomes so prolonged, especially during these years. But Allah compensates it. But a few years down the line, you guys will be having the shortest fasts ever, right? We might have to come here for Ramadan at that time. <laughs> for now, you can come over by us. It's fine, no problem. It's actually permissible to travel to a place where the fast is shorter. Nothing wrong to do that. You can actually travel to a place where the fast is shorter in order to spend Ramadan with your children or those who might not be so well or those who just cannot keep such a long fast. It's not prohibited. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. I know you're looking at me like, are you going to give us the money to go on holiday? You know? But my brothers and sisters, Ramadan is a blessed month. It's a blessed month. When we see the moon, that goodness, and when... You know, the lights are turned on in the masjid and the people are fulfilling their salah. And even in the homes, the environment is such that wallahi, the blessedness, you feel it. You can actually feel it. It's different. The food you consume during the evening in Ramadan has a taste to it that is different from that which was eaten, even if it were the same dish before or after Ramadan. It's a blessing. But my brothers and sisters, remember that that initial hype, the initial high that we're... Sorry, I'm not talking of cannabis, not at all. <laughs> but the initial high that you feel, subhanallah, we need to maintain that. You need to keep going. The Prophet sallallahu has taught us about how the best of deeds are those that are done regularly, even if they're little, small deeds but done regularly. So when we start Ramadan, yes, we're excited. The first day we were with the Imam, we heard the whole of Surah Baqarah. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. The next day we're not there. Why? Hey, it was a bit long yesterday. SubhanAllah. By the way, what's the score guys? Anyone knows? One nil. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al al azim. One nil. SubhanAllah. People are following football. No, it's okay. It is one nil by the way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. <laughs> People are asking us, why did you time it such that you're going to Cardiff tomorrow? I said, just as well, we didn't go to Cardiff today, you know. But my brothers and sisters, that will only be understood by the football fans, right? Uh, so that hype, we have a hype. You know, we support a football team and we get so excited. I see people... MashaAllah, they look so religious. They weep, they cry tears when their team is losing. I promise you, they make dua like they haven't even made for their own mothers-in-law. They make dua like they have never made for their family members. Just for a team, for a ball to be kicked this way and that way. The point I want to raise is look at how passionate we become. We'll follow the team and keep going and the players and everything else. But I promise you, the season of Ramadan is far more important. We need to follow it with equally important, with, meaning with greater zeal. We need to make sure that we actually have this within us to say, look, this is the month. I am definitely going to make an effort because my brothers and sisters, without an effort, it's not going to come. 
You know, don't think that Allah will push you along all the way. No, you got to push yourself because Allah gave you the energy. Make the effort. Pro I promise you, without the effort, it's not going to happen. If we didn't make an effort, this event was not going to take place. And if you didn't make an effort, this event was not going to take place. You made an effort, we made an effort. We all tried to get this thing coming, get, you know, get it together. That's why it is here. And that's why we're all here. Imagine if somebody didn't think of it. And if somebody, if you guys didn't think of coming and contributing towards the success of this beautiful event with such a lovely, uh, you know, place that, a venue that we've had. Alhamdulillah, I was just telling one of the brothers, this venue is superb. Perhaps we should do more here. Subhanallah. Will each one of you bring along 10 of your friends with you? Inshallah. Yeah. And we can have a much more uh, impressive event, inshallah. By the will of Allah, who knows? Well, if you're really keen, you can always write up to Light Upon Light, inshallah, and tell them that we will make sure that it happens, inshallah. So, if you don't make an effort, you're not going to be able to achieve. When the first day of Ramadan comes, already you should have an intention that this month I'm going to dedicate. I'm going to dedicate. When Ramadan comes, it is a month where you will feel fatigued. You will feel tired. Your sleep is going to be upside down, especially in this part of the world. Your chores are going to be difficult to fulfill. The night is not going to be so easy, as short as it is. You've got to eat, you've got to make Maghrib, Isha, Taraweeh. Perhaps the Hajjud becomes a little bit easier. You might want to shorten it slightly. You're going to have to have Fajr and your sleeping times. And you will also hear about the debates regarding the timings of when you're allowed to put a date in your mouth or not. Right? All those debates are in their places. You might be thinking, well, please tell us what's the ruling. Do you want to know it? No, you don't. I might come up with a third opinion and I'm going to cause problems here. I'm not from this part of the world, so I leave it to the local scholars. They've probably studied it more than I have. But I want to tell you, there can be, there can be more than one correct opinion. Did you hear what I said? I'm a person who firmly believes that if you actually, in a matter of ijtihad, in a matter of, you know, uh, where the opinions are valid, you can actually have more than one valid opinion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us and accept our fasting. So it's not good enough to say your guys' fasting is not accepted because you know you, you ate for an hour more than we ate. If it is a valid opinion based on evidence, alhamdulillah, or based on what scholars who are reputable are saying, then alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us acceptance. I know it's a big debate, big debate. The difference is what, one hour, two hours between in the timing approximately? Can someone tell me? About an hour, an hour's difference, yeah. So we ask Allah to make it easy for every one of us. Whether you're following the later time, the earlier time, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Remember that. So you need to have it within you in advance. You need to know, I'm going to be tired. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to keep going because we want the pleasure of Allah. Allah has promised you Jannah and Jannah is not free. And Jannah is not such an easy uh, achievement. When the hadith says, Allah inna sil'at Allahi ghaliya. Indeed, the commodity of Allah is expensive. It's dear, which means it costs. You have to pay for it. If it was something so easy, he wouldn't have said that. That's why when there are deeds that you do, and Allah says in return you get Jannah, that deed is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be really difficult. You need to make an effort. I gave an example a few days ago of how when the hadith says to serve your parents, you will gain Jannah. You need to know that's not going to be easy. It's going to be one of the most difficult things I'm ever going to be able to do. Especially as you get older and you've got your own family with your own kids. And then you still have to juggle between your wife and your parents and so on and your family members, etc. That is why Allah says you will get Jannah. You see, because it's tough. It's very difficult. It's not easy. Same applies to the month of Ramadan. To stand with Iman and Ihtisab. To fast with Iman and Ihtisab. The hadith says you will be totally forgiven. One narration says you will be given Jannah. What's Iman and what's Ihtisab? Iman is the conviction in your heart, the belief that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah, to earn the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihtisab means I'm doing this expecting a reward from Allah. Allah promises me a reward and I'm doing this for this reward. Some people say, I don't want to do it for the reward. I don't want to do it for this and for that. I just want to do it for myself. Well, as a Muslim, you need to 
rectify that intention. You do it for the pleasure of Allah. Allah instructed you, that is why you are going to do it. Yes, and you will be happy to do it. So you are actually doing it for the sake of Allah and you will achieve goodness from it. But you need to make your mind up from now. This Ramadan, I'm going to read Quran. And I'm going to make sure, come what may. I'm going to cover the entire Quran in this month. Many of us, unfortunately, perhaps the majority of us, we don't complete the entire Quran in Ramadan. Right? I want to teach you something this year that will make life so easy for you. From now, you can download an app. Perhaps on Quran Central, you can download that app, Quran Central. Choose one of your favorite reciters. And guess what? If the reciter is reading a little bit slow, what you do is let the reciter read a little bit and you repeat after the reciter. And you repeat after the reciter. If you have the opportunity to open the Quran in front of you, you can hear the recitation and read after the reciter. And you just finish a quarter juz after every salah. A quarter juice. What's that? Not more than 10 minutes after every salah. Or sit in the evening and do it for 30 minutes. You've got the whole juice done. Sit in the evening, sit in the morning while you're waiting for iftar, whatever. But you need to promise yourself from now. That's one way of doing things. And that's for those perhaps who might not be professional in recitation of the Quran. And you will perfect or improve your Quran. But if you don't have a plan, you're not going to get anywhere. You don't have a goal. What's going to happen? That football match, you don't even know where the goalposts are. And I think some players are like that, the way they operate. Open goalposts and the guy flicks it right over. And you wonder, gosh, did you see, man? You know? <laughs> May Allah grant us ease. This is what's happening to us in Ramadan. Open goalposts. We're not scoring any goals. Because we don't have a plan. We don't even know what we're supposed to be achieving here. So... If you have an aim and an objective and you have a goal, you will achieve. I, one thing that you have to promise this Ramadan, and I made you promise this earlier, I'm repeating the same thing. Do you remember what promise you made earlier today? What was it? We're going to concentrate on our? Forgotten. On our? Character. Subhanallah. We're going to, you see the others, we've just eaten, mashallah, munched, alhamdulillah, maila horse or whatever it was. We've forgotten everything else, mashallah, tabarakallah. We will concentrate on our character. Many of us in Ramadan, we fail dismally when it comes to character. In your home, with your spouse, with your parents, with your brothers and sisters, with your children, with whoever else there may be, out of the home, those who work with you, those you interact with, Muslim or non-Muslim, whoever they may be, you must improve your character. Ramadan is a month of shining. And Ramadan is a month of working hard on your bad habits and getting rid of them. If you have bad words that you add in your speech, eradicate them forever not just for the month of ramadan you don't need to use those words you're a believer you're upright the respect that you will enjoy from people is very closely related to the type of language and the expressions on the face that you have and you use with the people if you have a good expression and you use brilliant language they will respect you come what may but if you have a bad expression, you're looking gloomy, you're looking like you don't even want to talk to the people, you're looking angry all the time, trust me, they won't even want to come near you. And if you were to talk to them harshly, they will run away from you. That's why we always say, if you want to know if, Allah, if Allah's mercy is upon you, take a look at your character. I'm talking of Muslimin, Muslims. We fail to realize sometimes the importance of greatness of character. How do you make people feel when you walk by? Do you acknowledge them? Do you smile? Do you maybe greet them? Do you at least give a good feeling, you know, to the people around you? Subhanallah, sometimes we don't. And more importantly, the non-Muslims. Because today, look what's happening. Over the globe, people have such a bad misconception that is being unfortunately driven by various sectors across the globe that Muslims are the worst people on earth. Yet, subhanallah, every day aren't we supposed to be struggling to be the best of people? 
the most charitable, the most compassionate people, the, 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 the ones with the best language, the best expressions, the ones who reach out not just to humanity but even to animals. We don't even reach out to animals. Subhanallah. And this is a month of compassion. It's at our doorstep. Are we planning to improve our character? It starts today. Cut out your bad words. Learn to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say, I love you. I adore you. To the right people, by the way. <laughs> yes. Learn to say, and you, you earn Jannah through this. You make your spouse, whom you are supposed to be making feel the best feeling, you give them that feeling. Don't you deserve a reward? I mean, that's the mother of your children or the father. The, the dedication, the effort, the sacrifice, what they've done, what they do on a daily basis, they might make mistakes. We all make mistakes. That's not the end of the world. We will rectify. Obviously, it depends what mistake. They can't punch you up and then you say, didn't you hear the, say, the, the sheikh say, it's okay, you know, it's fine. You can give me another chance. And you blew and you're saying, yeah, I heard it, you know. May Allah not, may Allah not let that happen. There is a limit beyond which, obviously, you, you can walk out. There is a limit. You, you don't just, you know, uh, sponge in everything. No. There is a limit. If someone is abusing you, and that abuse hits a level where it is unacceptable, and you, are, you cannot do anything about it, and you would like to perhaps terminate, you may follow that path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, our children, our boys, our girls, and all those who are married, and even those who are not married, may Allah grant you the spouses who will be the coolness of your eyes. But going back to the issue of character and conduct, when we say charity begins at home, it really does. Because in Islam, the beginning of a charity is with your expression. People don't understand that. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, a charity is to smile at the face of you, the others. A charity is to smile. That's the word of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a charity. Moments ago, there was a charity raising funds, right? We should have all just said, guys, I'll give you 20 smiles. I'll give you 15 smiles. You can give me 500 smiles. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Sometimes your smile is more desperately needed than your money. Do you know that? I know many beggars who say, you know, it's just because I'm desperate. But if I wasn't, I would have thrown this money back at the guy's face the way he threw the money at me. You don't ever throw money. Money is... It can be converted into an act of worship with the correct intention and used in the proper way. You place it with respect in the hands of the people you are giving it to. You don't ever throw money. Never. Respectfully give it. A lot of respect. It's a ni'mah of Allah. It's a boon. It's a favor. It's a gift. Allah gave you a gift. These gifts, you don't just throw them. May Allah bless us. This month is a month of giving. It starts with your expression. That's why I said... I want to myself personally concentrate on my character this month. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that everyone around me feels important. They feel loved. They feel great. They feel grand. No matter what. May Allah make it easy for me and for all of us. I'm inviting you to join me in this challenge. Are you ready? Ah, oh, beautiful. Lovely. MashaAllah. Some of the young boys out here are the most enthusiastic about it. But yes, it will make a difference, not just with you, with your families, with your neighbors, with those around you, with your cities, within your country. You will change the perception of who a Muslim actually is. Subhanallah. The problem with us when we think Ramadan, you know, people were saying, you guys are going to talk the whole day about Ramadan. Yeah, we can talk the whole month about Ramadan. It's okay. Because we've got things to say that people sometimes have taken for granted. When we say Ramadan, what do you think of? Fasting and taraweeh. What else? Iftar maybe. What else? Sleeping. A lot of people think of sleeping in Ramadan, right? And sometimes we were looking for excuses not to fast. Any small excuse. Oh, I'm lucky I've got this excuse. I'm not fasting, mashallah. Oh, okay, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Some of the men... Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Let me not say what I was about to say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. You know, my brothers, my sisters, without dedication and without hard work, you won't achieve. You won't achieve. So let's have the plan and let's fulfill it. When the second night of Ramadan comes in, remember this day. 
Remember what we are promising today. What are we promising? We are saying that when the second night of Ramadan comes in, we won't be lazy. We're going to get up and say, ah, uh-uh, I'm not going to falter. I'm not dwindling. I'm not going down. I know. We lead the taraweeh in the masjids. We deliver sometimes talks in the masjid. We try not to prolong. This year, the series will not be more than 12 minutes, inshallah. Some people come and say, no, please lengthen it. You know, wait, hang on, hang on. We have to cater for those who really find it difficult to listen to a good talk. So unfortunately, we're going shorter and shorter and shorter. There will come a time when we'll have to get up, speak for three minutes and walk away. Because you'll be losing out on your game, I think. Allah, make it easy. So remember, you're going to have to get up again and make sure it happens. When we get up for taraweeh and for the lecture, we notice first day is packed, second day slightly less, third day, okay. Fourth day is as though everyone is gone for umrah. <laughs> Mashallah. A week later, they come back with a haircut. <laughs> and you wonder, Mashallah, how was your umrah? Umrah? Who went for umrah? Say, oh, but I thought you went for umrah. No, no, I just had a haircut. But you were missing from the masjid. We can't even say you were missing from the masjid because nowadays it makes it sounds like, oh, so you were taking register here, you know? That's not what we were doing. But I'm just saying, guys, you know, come on, let's, uh, this is the house of Allah. I promise you, when we are connected to the houses of Allah, to the masjid, it is a sign of closeness to Allah. If I were connected to your house, and I could walk in there anytime and feel at home, sit comfortably and do what I'd like in the lounge and you know, help myself to the fridge and the whatever else and the food and so on. Doesn't that depict a closeness in relationship? I can come in and walk out. I promise you, if you want a good relationship with Allah, walk into His houses more often. Just go more often. You see the house of Allah, stop there, salah, go in, salam alaikum brothers, how are you guys, everything okay, sisters, subhanallah, you know, in the sense that within your own uh, space, you can also do the same, subhanallah. And you know what? You will find a huge difference in your life. Very big difference. Because the hadith speaks about, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ The person whose heart is connected to the masjid. That person will be Allah's guest on the day of Qiyamah. Special guest. You came to my house so many times. Today I'm going to honor you. That's what it is. It's a hadith. Seven people who will be granted a special shade on the day of Qiyamah. One of them is a person who, whose heart was always at the masjids. They wanted to go. They wanted to... Do you know the calmness in the masjid is only felt by those who know it. When they go before everyone else. And as you enter and it's still quite empty, you can feel that serenity. Subhanallah. Feel it. And you come out feeling so good about things. MashaAllah. Just make sure you smile at people. And if someone comes and says, Uncle, Uncle, are you the guy from the hardware? You know, I need to buy a wheelbarrow. Say, Friday, inshallah, we'll talk outside. People do this. They discourage you from coming to the mosque by asking you for discounts because that's probably the only time they got to stand next to you and they're building a big building, you know. And they know we're going to save a lot of money. But it's wrong to go into the masjid with the intention of meeting someone for business. And this is why when people say, hey, you know, I need to see you. Okay, I'll see you in the masjid. I say, no, no, no. The masjid, I'm going to see Allah. We can meet you in the car park afterwards, outside there, inshallah. And see what's happening, subhanallah. Another very interesting factor. My brothers and sisters, this Ramadan, we're quitting smoking. Done? Done? Some of you have already quit it. And some of the youngsters saying, yes, don't even smoke. This Ramadan, we're cutting smoking. It's going. It's being thrown out. The world has thrown it out. We have to throw it out. We have to cut out smoking this Ramadan. You know what? One of the worst things ever is for a person to break a fast with a cigarette. And it's happening. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm glad to hear that cigarettes are so expensive that people can't even afford them at times. It's bad for the health. It's something bad. Isn't it something you should quit for the month of Ramadan? If your heart is not going to be softened by that, what will it be softened by? If Ramadan didn't stop you from bad, then what is going to stop you from bad? If Allah gave you a month to reflect on your bad habits and you haven't, then what is going to make you reflect on your bad habits? Are you waiting for something worse to happen to you than perhaps a little car accident? You want to lose a limb? You want to be... 
perhaps told that you are terminally ill. May Allah grant shifa to those who are sick and ill. Say Ameen. Do you want to be told about the death of a loved one? What do you want to be told before you are going to change? What do you want? Write it down. It will come to you. But you know what? A winner is a person who doesn't wait for all of that. What are you waiting? What did Allah give you? Come on, you've committed enough sins. Cut it, chop it, it's over. Come on, we know what it's all about. Let's now be better people, well behaved. We're going to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going, to, we're going to live with dignity and we're going to live inshallah in a way that we reach out to others. I don't want to think just because I'm living, you know, reading five salah a day. So I need to look at the others and say, guys, I'm going to Jannah. You know, you guys are not. That's the attitude today. I'm going to Jannah, you guys are not going. That's how people think. That thought itself is problematic. It shows that your heart is diseased because to feel superior to someone is a problem. You don't know upon what condition you're going to die and you actually are judged based on how the match ended. You could be losing 5-0, but the match you could win it 6-5. Do you agree? And when you were 5 nil, you were already telling people, you guys are out, you're not going through, you, you guys are totally this and that. Guess what happened? There was a comeback, 6-5, quiet. Same thing happens in our deen. We look at others and condemn them and tell the guys, you guys, there's no hope. You guys, it's over. You've been so bad, it's out. And we walk like we're the big kings here. You don't know tables can turn at any time. They have turned and they keep turning. That's why be humble, be humble. Look at people with respect. Talk to them. Even if they are struggling with a few things, help them through. I was speaking about smoking. I've witnessed people come out of the masjid in Ramadan. And the first thing they do is light a cigarette. Straight. My brother, I know you probably have the excuse of saying, but you know, I just needed that. Hang on. It's a month. Cut it out, inshallah. Ask Allah's help. Replace it with something healthy. I spoke about exercising and burning a bit of, you know, calories or whatever you want through the day. Or even in Ramadan, perhaps even in the evenings, depending on your timing. Through the day is not bad as well. And I tell you, if you replace cigarettes with something healthy, you won't miss the cigarettes. It's just in your mind. People say, but it's affecting my... Uh -uh. It's in the mind. You can help yourself. I know people will hear this later and comment saying, no, you don't know because you're not a smoker. I, I know. Because I definitely am not a smoker. <laughs> so much so that one brother comes to me and says, okay, I, I'll give it up, but tell me, will I have it in Jannah? <laughs> what a question. I'll give up smoking, but will I have it in Jannah? And I says, you know what? Yeah, possibly if you have a fire to light it, you know. <laughs> to get that fire, you're going to have to go somewhere else, you know. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. This is the thing, my brothers and sisters, we're worried about what we're going to get in Jannah without worrying about going to Jannah. It's the third time I've said it in just as many days. We're worried about what we're going to get in Jannah without worrying about getting to Jannah. How ironic. How ironic. So, Ramadan is a month of softening. Your problems that you have, your difficulties you have, your disputes you have in your family, mostly are connected to a few topics. A few topics. Number one, money. Connected to wealth. Brothers killing each other because of money. Wealth. Don't worry. I promise you, if you can resolve your matter for the sake of Allah and be the bigger one. You know, we have disputes at home. Once you get married and you've got your own spouse and kids, suddenly you have politics with your siblings and your parents and everyone else. Cut it. Be the bigger person. Yes, protect yourself. You know, sometimes it's better to be at a respectful distance than to be disrespectfully together. Did you hear what I said? To be disrespectfully together in one home or in each other's faces is worse than to be at a respectful distance or at a distance respectfully. I prefer that. I prefer to be at a distance and respectful rather than be in each other's faces when you're not even getting along. We want to greet each other. We want to be able to resolve matters. If solving a problem is 
simply by saying I'm sorry when you're not really wrong. Sometimes be the bigger person and say those three words to resolve a 20 year dispute and walk away with a smile. In your heart, you know it's okay, I did it for the sake of Allah, fine. And then don't go around saying, you know, I had a big heart. I just said, I'm sorry, but I know I was right. These guys were still wrong. Because now, that, that wasn't genuine. It's going to go back to square one. And you're going to start the problem all over again. Our egos let us down, my brothers and sisters. Our egos let us down. I don't want, I'm never, I, that's it. I can't forgive. I'm not going to forgive. Imagine when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu's daughter Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu was accused of having an affair. A'udhu billah. And you know what? Allah clarified her name. And at the same time, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was so angry with one of, the, one of his relatives who was spreading a rumor. And that relative was a poor person whom they used to spend on. Imagine you giving a guy a salary every week or every month. And that's the same guy who's speaking bad about you and spreading rumors about your family. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, justifiably, human nature. He said, Wallahi, I'm never going to spend on this person again. And Allah says, وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُولُو الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى Those whom we have given virtue to, those whom we have blessed with the blessings of so many things such as wealth and whatever else, they will not make a promise not to spend on their relatives. They won't make a... They are... Those whom we have blessed will not stop giving others. They will not promise not to give their relatives and those who have done the hijrah. But instead, forgive and embrace. Would you not like that Allah forgives you? If you want Allah to forgive you, forgive, embrace. He forgave, he embraced, and he was the best to tread this earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He forgave and he embraced, as difficult as it was. Are you prepared? I know each one of us, each one of us, we have our little struggles. Sometimes these struggles are connected to people whom we just don't want to see. Yes, it's there. But you know, the burden on your shoulders, you can just remove it and release it. Say, listen, you know what, it's okay. Even if the person is toxic and you would like to stay away from them, stay away from them in a beautiful way. What does that mean? No comments. I don't want to say anything good. I don't want to say anything bad. I'm just going to keep quiet and do my thing. That's also fine. It's the, it's the least of the lot, meaning it's the bottom of the list. Someone is toxic. They haven't changed. They keep harming you. They keep attacking you. They keep, you know letting you down in so many different ways. You are justified to stay away, but don't hold it in your heart and don't say it to people all the time, this person is like that. Like, keep quiet. Someone says something, say, look, I've got no comment. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to mess my mouth and I'm just going to leave them. That's the least you could do. So what I said today, we will forgive as far as possible. Don't let your ego come in the way. Especially family and others. When it gets toxic and when you know that, you know what? I'm not going to be able to live with this person and interact with them. Today I'm teaching you to forgive them, but you don't have to interact with them. Difference. When I was young and up to not long ago, and still we hear people say forgive and forget. I believe that doesn't exist. The forgive part, I can do. The forget part... It will take time. Do you agree? The forget part takes time. It's not in my hands to forget. I will remember. In fact, I should remember so I'm not bitten from the same place twice. Should remember. But I've forgiven. When you forgive, do you have to embrace and interact? The answer is, it is recommended to do so, but it's not necessary. If the person is toxic. I've forgiven, but I don't want to interact. Am I justified? Yes, you are. It's okay. Don't worry. Have you seen the difference now between the two? There are people, I'm sure, in your lives, you must be nodding your heads. You've got a little picture, a cartoon popping up at the top. They boom, with a face. That's the woman. You know, that's the guy. Right? 
toxic, which means I, I don't want. But I've forgiven, I've let it go. I'm not holding it against them. Oh, and you make dua for them without them knowing, Oh Allah, grant them. Oh Allah, bless them. Oh Allah, give them more goodness. Why? Why? That's tough, right? Because when you pray for the goodness of someone else, the angels are asking Allah to give you the same, if not more. And to get the dua of the angel, you're going to have to just pray for someone else. You follow what I'm saying? And the dua of the angel is more righteous than yours. It requires a big heart. Oh Allah, bless them. Give them. I remember one guy was told that, you know what, if you're going to make dua for this enemy of yours, when you make dua for yourself, we're going to give your enemy double. Did you hear that? When you make dua for yourself, we're going to give your enemy double. So he says, okay, I'd like a mountain of gold. So he got a mountain, his enemy got two mountains. Ah, he's upset. You've got your mountain, you asked for it. So what? If we give the other guy or don't give the other guy, it's irrelevant. He asked for a beautiful castle. And the enemy got two of those castles. Whoa, whoa. Then he says, okay, do me a favor. Scare me half to death. Okay. What did he want? Subhanallah. He wanted his, that buddy to get scared all the way to death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Allah forgive us. But this is the nature of man. We cannot see someone flourish when what we have is enough for us. It's more than enough for us. I, I want to raise one thing that Ramadan should bring about. We are supposed to be reaching out to the poor. The wealthier we get, the more miserly we tend to become. And there are exceptions to that. There are definitely exceptions. But when you have a business, for example, and it's a huge business, you lose sleep over a tack shop that is opened across the road selling something similar to you. You lose sleep. But you're a multi-million dollar company, multi-million dollar store. And you're worried about a small tuck shop that is across the road. And you're losing sleep over it. The millions you've made, you're never ever going to use them in your life. And your generations will probably be killing each other because they want your money, not even theirs. And you know what? You're worried about a guy who's trying to earn something halal. So what? Where is your iman gone? In this month of giving, learn to give and be happy when someone else has started up something similar to what you have started. Because sustenance comes from Allah. I learned this in some of the Middle Eastern countries when I was in Medina and we walked into the stalls and so on. When you go to buy abayas, the whole lot of shops are abaya shops. It makes it easy. They're not upset. I have one. You're not allowed to have anyone else here. I'm the only person here. They say, no, it's fine. I recall a story of a person I used to go and sit with at times and he found something that one of the customers wanted. And then he says, my sister, do me a favor. The shop down there has had no customers today. Can you please go and buy the same thing from that person? And then he phones the brother, he says, Abu Sulaiman, you know what? Uh, I'm just sending a customer there, just barakah, you know, so that you can open your day. I see no customers have come to you today. Would you do that? Nah, bro, you must buy from me. Where's your iman gone? I'd rather have one less commodity sold and have be filled with blessing and get a dua that is made for me by the angels than to go out and try and grab someone else's you know, opportunity. May Allah protect us. That's the greed that man has. Ramadan is here to clean your greed. You're supposed to be cleaning the greed. You follow what I'm saying? Clear it up. So this Ramadan, inshallah, we want to soften the heart. Character, conduct, dedication. Inshallah, we're going to read the Quran. We're going to be as enthusiastic through the month. And when Ramadan ends, we are going to continue, inshallah, with a few little things that we've gained in Ramadan. So that if every Ramadan you move five centimeters, by the time 10 Ramadan uh, are completed, you've moved half a meter, half a meter. And when 20 Ramadans are over, you've done the entire meter. Walillahi alhamd wal minna. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah bless you all. And thank you so much for... Uh, your attendance this evening. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success and to open our doors. Uh, the brothers are telling me that I still have three more minutes. So alhamdulillah, I can continue. My brothers and sisters, 
it is very important to seek the forgiveness of Allah. It's the month of forgiveness. Do you know that the minor sins you commit are automatically forgiven without even you knowing as you do good deeds and as you fulfill your farad. You've done your salah, you committed one or two minor sins, you've done another salah, and between the two salahs, there's a great possibility that Allah just wiped out those sins because now you did a good deed. <laughs> Indeed, good deeds wipe out bad deeds. When you do good deeds, you wipe out the bad deeds. So one of the ways of increasing your closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by increasing your good deeds. Someone told me, I've got a bad habit, what should I do? And I said, my brother, this bad habit to eradicate it, you need willpower, you need to ask Allah, and you need to increase your good deeds. So by increasing good, you won't have much time for the bad anymore. Increase the good. It's like a seesaw. If I'm increasing on one side, the other side is naturally going to become light. And if I've increased the one, the other one becomes light, and so on. So remember to seek the forgiveness of Allah, and to increase your good deeds so that it can remain. Because many of us seek the forgiveness of Allah and we fall back into the sin. Seek the forgiveness of Allah, regret, remorse, fall back into the sin. But don't allow that to happen. If it does, don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. But don't plan it. Be strong. Learn to say no. Learn to just say no for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll find the goodness. You'll find the purity. Help people along and see what happens to you. My brothers and sisters, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this Quran. And the Quran is going to bear witness for you or against you. This Quran will come on the day of judgment and talk about you. Al Quran hujjatul laka aw alayk. This Quran is either for you or against you. Let the Qur'an be bearing witness for you by learning it, reading it, understanding it, putting it into practice, conveying it to others, and understanding the context of revelation. For indeed, the verses of the Qur'an have a context. Without understanding the context, sometimes you could misunderstand things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect every one of us. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.